Hello, and welcome to the 6-5 Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners of Futurum Research. And on behalf of my team at Futurum and the team at More Insights and Strategy, welcome. We're so glad you're here. This keynote session kicks off our collaboration, customer experience, and contact center track. And More Insights' Patrick Moorhead has the opportunity to sit down with Panos Panay, the Executive Vice President and Chief Product Officer at Microsoft, about the Microsoft Surface product line and the importance of seamless experiences across both hardware and software. I'm looking forward to what Panos has to say on this topic, and I'll bet you are too. Let's go have a listen. Panos, it's great to see you and thank you so much for kicking off this track for the 6-5 Summit. I mean, getting to know you over the last few years has has been has been pretty awesome and i appreciate awesome. you doing this you're so nice <laughs> i i are you kidding i'm i'm pumped to be here it's fun and then you're you're polite and you're so nice pat like uh, i'm excited excited to not only watch and and spend time uh, watching your event but also just be here with you now is great oh, i appreciate appreciate this and listen there's nothing uh well I'm an ex product person. I love products. Okay. And, and one of the benefits of my role now as an industry analyst is that I can advise on a lot of products. I can be part of so many product launches and, and developments. I'm, I'm like a, a kid in a, a candy store, but you actually have the best title at Microsoft, I think, which is chief uh, product <laughs> officer. I mean, like, how did you get into this? And, how has what you did for the previous decades kind of gotten you ready for the big role? Oh, it's a good question. I uh, I do feel like I'm lucky. I'm I, I feel blessed to have the title I have and be able to do the job I do. And you know, and and sometimes it means it can mean uh, responsible for everything and nothing at the same time. You know, it just depends. Yeah, I'm also responsible, as you know, for Windows all up and Surface as as the brands, you know, kind of that I oversee in the product lines and businesses. But as as you know, product for me too. It's that's what I am. I'm a product maker, near and dear to my heart. It's what I've done, Pat, for I don't know the better part of uh, 25, 30 years. I think I hate to reflect on how old I am, so I just kind of I ignore the actual date said timelines. Oh, wait a second! Doesn't start... it's wisdom, wisdom, Panos? <laughs> <laughs> Not getting older. Come on! <laughs> uh, I feel so wise, Pat. <laughs> it's in the gray. It's in the gray. Actually, it's in the. It's like it's showing up everywhere. Uh, I I have to say, uh, you know, I started my. People ask me like, where, 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 how do you think about every detail? Why do you care about so many of the nuances? What is it about understanding the customer or who it's for? Or why does that matter so much? And that's what product making is this collection of so many things. We tell the team and especially kind of new people joining the team, like you, you're here because of your history. You're here because of all the things that you've done to get you to this point, especially if, as a product maker. And you, you have to believe in that history. You have to use it. Everything we've learned, when you talk about growth mindset, it really is about what have I learned along my journey that includes success, failure, that, that includes you know, the most trying times and, and maybe even the most simplest or happiest of times. And all that, you know, including us as in our childhood, like where we came from is part of the motivation when you make something or build something. And so like as a product maker, I feel like we're all product makers, but for me, uh, I started getting my hands on devices when I was, you know, a kid, six, seven years old. I was lucky. My dad was a, uh, a hardware engineer, and uh, he had this love for tinkering and building products. When I was I don't know, six or seven, I would be in my room, and I'd go to bed, and I, you know, like any, like any, anyone who was you know, any child, if you will, at that age at bedtime. So I'd go to bed, I'd complain. I didn't want to go to bed, which never doesn't make sense to me now. Like I do anything to get to bed. And, and when, you know, you get to bed and I laid down and it turns out at that time, uh, my father and I shared a room. I mean, it was my bedroom and it was his office. And so he would come in every night, Pat, and he would, um, work on his hobby, which was building either a TV or a radio, in this case, a TV. And, you know, he built, he had the tube and he was, did his own soldering and he had everything laid out and uh, he had 2D drawings that he would work off of. Uh, 
And it was amazing what he would do. And the best part was he would always know I was awake. And so he would just ask me to join him. We wouldn't tell mom, of course. And so I'd get out of bed and I'd, I'd get at it. And honestly, you know, just being with my dad, that was years of building products. He's here visiting me in Seattle right now. So, so I feel, you know, I feel lucky to be able to still spend the time with him. And we actually, I told him I was going to talk to you today. And we did talk about a little bit about what we made and he gets this pride, you know, and, and, uh, he still has the original TV that we built. I mean, it's, it's pretty ugly for sure, but at the time it felt it was beautiful. And, and for what it was being made for incredible, you know, and through my career, I was able to just hit different points and I'll call that, you know, maybe not at six or seven years old, a career, but it is like, you're, you're learning, you're finding the things you fall in love with the tinkering, the building, yeah. the making. And I did that my whole life. I ended up actually, you know, there were two moments in, in my career that I don't talk about a lot, but one of them is I joined uh, Eminem Mars, Calcan. And, and a lot of people don't know that about my history, but uh, I, I was, what I did was production management and kind of moving dog food around the country and cat food, I should say. I'm a, I'm a you know, dogs and cats, but I know that seems interesting, but, you know, at one point, Pat, I you know, to make sure the quality of the dog food was right, we used to taste it and eat it, you know, be that's part of just understanding it. Um, so it's kind of ironic that I would actually taste dog food versus uh, now I dog food all my own products. It's almost the same thing, you know, what we talk about. And I think that's where that quote comes from. But I went to a Japanese company after that. I went into tech um, and I spent five years, uh, four or five years with a with an incredible set of Japanese engineers just kind of walking me through the details and what it meant to build a product, what patience meant, what every detail meant, uh, the beauty and how something can come out of a product like that. I spent my years just felt feeling like, um, I think the whole time, just learning what what it really meant um, and then pulling that all together ended up at Microsoft. And, and I came here to work on mice and keyboards. And um, <clears throat> that was 18 years ago. And it just yeah. kind of evolved through all the hardware it did quite a while. And I'm pretty sure that I used every mouse and keyboard that you, <laughs> that you worked on. Um, I mean, it's so funny, too, that the industry was trying to get, get, get rid of the mouse. And it just keeps just keeps coming back, you know. Uh, it, it is amazing. So how on earth do you take your knowledge of mice and keyboards and turn it into the surface line? By the way, a fun fact, I have every model surface and design that you've ever made uh, in, in, my, in, in, my, in my tech warehouse, all, all the way back to version one with two different processor makers inside. But, but how did you, how do you go from mice and keyboard to surface? Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, that's awesome. I, I, I don't think I have every device, Pat, you know, I'll, but I'll I, share. I have a few. That, I'll share. I do have a, I do have a few that we didn't ship as well, by the way, those ones okay. you don't have, but if you do, I'd be pretty impressed on how you got them for sure. Uh, look, the, that seam back then, you know, mice and keyboards were there to complete an experience. And while they seem like simple accessories or maybe, you know, something you attach to what you do, imagine, imagine life without one of those two things right now. And, you know, think about that, that idea that, um, you know, hardware can complete a software experience and then take that and evolve it to actually the hardware and software need to be made together to create perfection. I think it was about 12 years ago or so kind of got tapped to, uh, go create a product like we, you know, I was, I knew hardware, I knew it pretty well. I knew software, but also kind of the, how you brought something to market with, a uh, with windows. That was what I had spent, you know, four or four or five years on. And, uh, we were, we were having some pretty good success and that when we were, when the company was developing windows eight, they, they, uh, had this thought on, Hey, how do we complete that experience with hardware? And that's what we did. So we built. Um, we, we went from the ground up, you know, surface wasn't even called surface when we started Pat, it was just, let's go build it. It was a tablet, like let's build a tablet. Right. And I, and, you know, I was working at the time I was working on the, um, surface table, if you remember it. Yes, absolutely. And so when, my, and my so, silicon, uh, was in the, the first generation of that. Oh, is that actually you tie that off? That's right. And I think you, if you, uh, 
and just cut to building this product, you know, there were 12 people, we got together, I put together a vision and thought a little bit about what it could be. And, um, you know, when we started, it was, it was pretty intense and it was different. Like you said, there were multiple silicon parties involved. It was definitely a sensitive topic for the company. Uh, you know, we had to kind of do it all in secret. It was, it was, it was culturally shifting, if you will, in many ways. And then, um, you know, we went through generation over generation. We ended up uh, getting to the vision that I, uh, you know, that the team originally had, which was Surface Pro 3, and kind of hit the ground and, and took off. Um, and we and we went to, you know, we, we anchored on a bunch of cultural attributes as a team and what it meant to us to build these products and what it meant to complete it for the company and bring Windows 8 to life. And so we went for it. And, you know, by the time Surface Pro 3 came around, ultimately to Surface Pro 4 with Windows 10, you, you start to see some momentum and, uh, you know, kind of took off from there. And, and the team started as 12. And I don't think I want to tell you how many people are on it now, but let's say it's a, it's a, it's a couple thousand more than 12 probably at this point. Yeah, by the way, that's that same time frame, Surface Pro 3 and Surface Pro 4 was when I saw, when I saw liftoff that, that said, this is a product line that has staying power and hats off to you for not bailing after, you know, a, a few, a few couple, couple of te intents. It really showed to me how strategic this was to a company because, you know, the PC environment is you make a small mistake and, and it is, it is going to be very costly. And that uh, scared people in the industry. And at the time, people were, were very risk averse. They were afraid to try things, right. Uh, for yeah. fear uh, of failing. And, and one thing that I, you know, I really admired was that you stuck your neck out time and time <laughs> again. <laughs> I, mean, I remember apologizing on stage, Pat, at one point. <laughs> but it really is not necessarily me sticking my neck out. It's, it's the truth of the company, you know, yeah. starting something, sticking with it, knowing, that 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 the purpose was was right. You know how you bring hardware and software together to make an incredible experience. You know Satya had come in right around that time, um, and was part of like that bet on hey, you know to to have permission to be in the hardware business, we do need that end to end product that people love. And uh, that was a that was a bet that I think still pays off today. And you got to hand it to you know there were so many senior leaders of the company that were just willing to be patient. And I think in product making and just in general, you know, one thing I've learned and even from my early days um, before Microsoft was patience, patience. Um, and then, you know, let, let, let your love flow into the product, let your, you know, um, expertise flow into the product, let your vision flow into the product. But uh, none of that works without patience and, and, you know, perseverance, of course, but really it's about, do you have a vision? Can you stick with it? And, and that's what product making is. You know, you know what it's meant to be. You know what it should be. Customer is telling you what they need. Patiently get yourself there. You, you know, getting there with the first version is always in, almost impossible. Um, you can get pretty close and maybe even sometimes hit it out of the park. But really, it's about listening to your customer after that and understanding what they need. And then you can, you can pretty much thrive. And kudos to the company there and, you know, to, just sticking with it and, and the leadership here at Microsoft for doing so. So two years ago, uh, the company put you in charge, in addition to Surface, in charge of the leader of Windows, which, you know, it's funny. I remember yeah. all the conversation and all the talk. Oh, my gosh, this the guy from Surface who's competing with me <laughs> moving to this Windows thing. What's this guy like? And I actually had to field questions from your, your customers on, no, 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 Panos is, you know, talk to Pan, this guy, he's going to love, you're going to love, love it. Right. And, and sure enough today, Arnold. they're just like, yeah, I really appreciate the point of view that Panos has because he has empathy for what I do. <laughs> right. Um, but, but yeah. tell me how, how did this come to be this appointment and, and what are some of the things that just, it means it, the, the, the conversations are around at least, you know, two, three years ago, um, we have such a great opportunity to remove these seams between hardware and software. And, and it's what our customers needed. And that's where it started from. Um, and 
you know, Windows 10 had, had done incredible, incredible things for, for our Windows customers. You're talking about over 1.2 billion or so people at that time, or 1.1 billion using it. And, you know, it was about how do we, how do we really take it one step further? And the conversations with, uh, you know, Satya, Rajesh, others, it really was about what is the next phase of Windows? How do we, how do we bring it to life in a way where people, you know, fall in love with it again, as opposed to just need it? And that was the conversation. Like, you know, people need Windows. Um, but, but really for me, my passion is I want, you know, I want people to love it. I want people to want it. Um, you know, you want to open it and feel good. And, um, a big part of that is making that seem between hardware and software go away. Actually a massive part. And my partners, like they're amazing. You think about the OEMs, and, um, Dell, HP, Lenovo, Acer, Asus, Samsung, you, you look at these partners and they truly are like they know how to build world-class hardware. They understand how to build incredible products. Um, they have supply chains that are just to die for. And and you you see that opportunity for, you know, you're talking about serving over a billion people, Pat, and what is the most selfless way to do that? It's bringing as many partners as you can. Look at that scene between hardware and software. Listen to your customers. And then let's go get something elegant done that people love because we kind of that transition in our, industry has been like, Hey, I want to fall in love with the product I use. I don't think people use those words. I get it. I've used it a lot, but, but it is that, you know, this, it's meaningful to me. The thing I use every day, the people I connect with on it every day. And then now you have windows 11, it's being adopted faster than any other OS we've ever shipped. Um, it's ramping. The usage is awesome. The people are finding ways to get different things done. There are new behaviors created through, you know, the pandemic and those behaviors are sticking and windows 11 is kind of enhancing the ability to get into the things you want to get done. And so there's a lot of pride in that. And, and as much as pride, uh, working with my partners, as much as it is this team that built windows 11, um, using all of the history of Microsoft to do that. I think it's been, it's been a good journey. It's been a fun journey so far. I mean, it's not, it's just the beginning, I hope, but, but indeed it's been fun. Yeah. So what are these, uh, I, I have to, I want to talk about collaboration real quick. It, it, yeah. you know, we just saw just a complete, um, retrench of, of how we work. And I think your team had some really smart viewpoints on it. You know, us analysts, we like to think that we're first to the trough with these great ideas. But, but one thing I'll, I'll admit that I picked up from your team was to said, Patrick, this hybrid thing is going to be harder than remote and it's going to be harder than, than where we were before. And sure enough, we're here. And I'm, I'm curious, Panos, you know, You've got Windows, you've got the operating system and the experience there, uh, along with uh, your own first party hardware and the rest of the partners. How do you view uh, the decisions you're making towards the future related to improving that collaboration experience? So a couple of ways to think about it. One, you know, what you what you use to collaborate is uh, it's it's different. It's different for so many people. And so you have to think that way. Like we're building a broad based ecosystem here. And so the first thing to think about is that's uh, different types of cameras, different screens, and probably most importantly, different applications or experiences that people use. The trick is for, for us to remove as many seams between all those things as possible. So when you and me want to connect, um, we remove them. And then the next step for us has been how do we emotionally connect people in a way that, hey, I want to be with you right now, Pat. I don't want to be here. You're Where are you, in Austin, likely? And I'm here exactly. in Redmond. And you go, okay, so it'd be so much better if I was in Austin, basically because I want the sun today. And I don't think it's <laughs> uh, but, but it is, but I'm not. I'm here. And it's a behavior that has shifted. And it's okay. This gave us the chance to connect. And that that is the behavioral shift that's going to stay where we can choose. There's a balance. Hey, Pat, you want to meet in person or should we get on this call? And it'll be a choice. And the choice should become one that is, it's ubiquitous. It's continuous. It doesn't matter which it is. It's just what's better for us today. To make that true, you got to connect with each other in a more emotional way. And whether that's um, perfection through the rendering of the screen, if you will, or the imagery, or it's the connection eye to eye. And, uh, 
or it's a simple background blur because I want some privacy, whatever it might be, the, the nuance in that, now we're back to product making, the details are going to matter. And our team's been looking at this for a long while, pre-pandemic. I mean, I, you know, I, it's so fun. I remember um, maybe three, four versions of Surface ago, we were celebrating the camera and people were like, who uses a camera on a PC? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I remember being in a room and people were saying, you know, why don't you just take out the camera? It's expensive. I don't, nobody needs it. Like they're not taking selfies with their computers. I mean, Pat, is that amazing? Like, isn't that no? No, you, I I totally forgot that was the case. But you are absolutely right. I, I remember just, that. I would show like a Skype video, like with my daughter and I. Like this is how we're going to communicate in the future. And they would people, go, what are you talking about? Don't you have a phone? And and so you're. It, if you take all that, it, what it did is it gave us a view of anchoring technology. So now we have this ability to not tax the CPU as much, don't tax the GPU as much. Let's make sure we optimize the PC, the design point uh, with our partners at Intel, AMD, and Qualcomm. Like, let's make sure we're optimizing everywhere in the stack for each opportunity that is an application. And then you can centralize that around Windows and the silicon to do so. And so that's where our focus is like, hey, remove as many seams as you can. In this case, these aren't actual physical seams you will ever see or the seam between software and hardware. I'm talking, I'm talking about the seam between you and I. And the easier I can make one touch calling, the easier we can get connected, the clearer this call is, the better the speakers are, the better the camera is, the better the microphones are. Uh, and quite frankly, the simpler it is to get in and out of a call uh, that ubiquity that's happening right now in collaboration will only get stronger. And then we get back to the vision of let's choose, Pat. Do you want to meet face to face today or do you want to meet on this call? And like, what's more advantageous for you and the rest of your world? Because it won't matter which it is. God, I love it. The, the, the other area that I, I have to admit, I didn't think I was going to get sucked into emotionally, but I did. Um, okay. What you're doing with inclusive design. I mean, listen, Panos, uh, I, you know, I, I have, I, I have empathy. I'm a kind of a hard ass from the Midwest. Right. And it's like me getting sucked into these things, but I have to tell you what you're doing in inclusive design has made me cry before uh, hmm. and go back and watch the previous summit interview uh, uh, that I did uh, talking, uh, with, with, uh, surface folks, uh, but can you share, can you share what you're doing, uh, here and what you did with the uh, ability summit? Yeah. First thing to focus is, yeah, we can't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate. I mean, one in every four people in the U S are disabled. Like just you, that's not something to just be like, Oh, okay. That's just, it's, I mean, when we design inclusively, you have to design for everybody. You're talking about one in four people in that sense. And you go, of course, um, I think in the world there's over a billion. And I mentioned that at the Ability Summit, um, people that are disabled. Just think about that. And the demographic is still growing. Like my job is to build products for everyone. Think about Windows. Windows isn't for a select few, you know, Pat, we don't just design it for like the cool people or the, exactly. or a certain age group. We design exactly. it for, uh, or, uh, the tech leader or anything. We design it for everybody. And that's, you know, that's challenging at times for sure. There are trade-offs that are going to come with it, but everybody includes, you know, literally everyone. And I have a real soft spot here for a lot of reasons I probably won't ever talk about personally, but I will tell you is meaningful to me up and down. The stack has to be perfect for um, disabled people. Dave Dame joined my team. Uh, I think about a year ago now, I don't know for sure. He's, he inspires me so much. Um, and Dave uh, will tell you stories how, look, everyone's going to be disabled one day. And when he, when he said that to me, um, you know, eventually we all get there, but some of us are getting there sooner and, uh, I can't like, it hits you so hard. You just realize like, there's so much opportunity to make things better for people. You know, we can say word, words like we're going to change the world and stuff. And I believe that don't get me wrong. Like we are going to empower every individual, uh, on the planet to achieve more, but it's more than belief. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it goes deeper. Like, I don't know, like it's hard to explain. So. Um, if you take a look, if you have a chance for those of you watching, go watch the ability summit, don't watch it for like, it's a cool show that doesn't matter. Go watch it for 
the impact that that each of us can have on the world with the changes we're making. You know, we launched a new adaptive mouse. You know, we um, uh, we have the adaptive Xbox controller. Before that, we have um, you know the adaptive kit. We fundamentally are enabling more uh, keyboard scenarios with our adaptive keyboard uh, our hub and some buttons. You know, those things are awesome. But you start to realize you you're you know this is not commodity product making. This isn't build one for everybody. This is build one for each person and who they are and how unique each of us are as people. And I think that matters uh, to all of us. To your point that you just made, like if you just sit back and think about it for a minute, uh, we're we're all part of making that um, making that thought of inclusive design true for all of us and. Some of that includes, you know, stuff you may not understand why you do it, uh, why, or others may not understand why we have done it. But at the end of the day, if, if we can design for everyone, that makes a difference for me. And we did that through Windows. And so one one note for just on this journey is when we create a product or when we're designing a product, and I mean that from every feature in Windows is a product to me, then there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, and I mean a lot of them, Pat. I can't give you the numbers. They're, 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 they intimidate me even when I say it. Uh, or if it's a hardware product or if it's a partner's product. Like the thing we start with is um, that specific design point of how is this inclusive and, and, and if it's not, why and where. And I think uh, when you start from that, you end up with something beautiful at the other end. We don't always get it right. Let's be clear. We don't always get it right. But, but, but we will work we will work pretty damn hard to make sure we we do everything we can for people. If you were getting it right every time, I would think that you're not taking enough shots and and stretching <laughs> enough. And you know, it's funny as we get older, and particularly analysts, industry analysts like me that have to pretend like we know everything. Uh, when Dave uttered the words, "Everyone will be disabled eventually," sometimes some of us just get there sooner. I literally froze, right. That's the quote. and I was just like. I couldn't believe I, you know, it was, I was looking at it as also this other thing. This is for other people, right? And it's like, no, this is going to actually likely be for me sometime in, in, in my life. And then it became real. And I think, uh, which, what you've been able to do, because part of this is education because, uh, we live in, you know, it is a village and we need more people doing a lot of this, but, that was a good way to make it real for people. And, you know, hats off to you. I, I went through your uh, lab that you uh, had set up. I went through there. Oh, the inclusive about, tech lab. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's I went there about, about a month ago and uh, it was first rate. So, hey, I, I have to ask, I have to want to wrap this up here. I have to ask you about yeah. build. I mean, Okay. A lot, a lot of stuff going on uh, with, with Windows, <laughs> a lot of Windows stuff. And it's like, well, wait a second. I heard, you know, out of the peanut gallery, I, well, Microsoft doesn't talk about Windows anymore uh, at Build. And, and it's like, here we are. We're talking big time Windows uh, during Build. What was the highlight uh, for you? I know you love all of your children the same, but what was, yeah, what was yeah, your thank highlight? Thank you for saving me. Oh, come on. See, you just did it. So you, you just did it. You told me what I can't say. Like, I look, there are so many people that work on Build, Pat. Yeah. Um, because it's 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 not to work on build per se. It's the work that's done uh, on the products that then kind of kind of manifest themselves at build to be spoken yeah. about. And so each one of these things, people put their heart into it. Whether it's Volterra or it's Azure Compute on the local device, the new Microsoft Store pieces, third-party widgets, they're all pretty dang cool. Um, well, how about if I bracket it to Windows and Surface? Does that help? I, I thought, look, uh, no, it doesn't help at all. Like, I mean, I'm still gonna, I'm still gonna upset somebody. Like, I got, somebody's going, somebody gets right. upset. But I'll tell you, look, it's fair to say, Volterra was a lot of fun. Yeah. If you were paying attention to Project Volterra, there's so much behind it. It's, it's, uh, it's opportunity for devs to really take advantage of just new processing power and a different way to think about compute. So for me. When I get a little bit geeky there, but that's where I go, you know, uh, well, there's something super romantic about all that, how all that comes together. And, um, you know, I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I just at heart, I'm not a dev and I want to be a dev. So I've always like, 
I feel like this, I guess my job now is to give as many tools as I can and, and hope that they love what those are. And I have an incredible dev dev team, if you will, like a, just a development organization that thinks about devs, um, creates tools for them all the time. And I, I'm pretty blessed to, to be part of that. But I think if you forced me, I would, I would go. Volterra brings in a lot of Windows, a lot of Surface, a lot of OEM opportunity. Like it brings everybody together. So I'm okay like saying that Windows dev kit was probably the, that's the way, that's the only uh, answer I can give you without getting myself in trouble with my Listen, best of friends. And, and my company spans, you know, uh, chips to SaaS. Uh, but if I had to pick the Windows and Sur I mean, it would have been that too. So okay, good. I'll you, can it. you All imagine, right. can you believe that? No. No, and we didn't, you know, we didn't talk about this beforehand or, or anything like that. But yeah, that, that would have been my favorite. And I don't know, I might have to uh, get on your website and uh, sign up for it, give it to my son, Patrick, and see what, uh, see what he can do with it. Gosh, I'll tell you Panos. what, you, when we're ready, we'll get it to Patrick and see I what he can do with appreciate it. Appreciate that. Sure. Panos, thank you so much for this. Uh, I'm sure the audience uh, loved it. You know, I appreciate you bringing in some of the personal stuff and I understand um, it's sometimes hard to do, but when it's in context of kind of how you got in here and how Panos thinks and how his team thinks and uh, reflects to me on what we can expect and the passion for your product. If you can get passionate for a product, people shouldn't even be in products, right? I'm with it you. is something that, that I have truly appreciated about uh, working uh, with your team. They're all passionate uh, about uh, different things and and making things better and thoughtfully thinking through them. So anyways, thanks for your time. I'm grateful. I'm grateful you had me, Pat. Uh, be well, my friend. Thanks.